Hi everybody. Welcome to lecture number 1 Introduction to sockets. In this lecture we are going to discuss about what is a socket? What are the types of sockets available? What are the function calls used for the sockets? Or we can say what are the functions used to create a socket? And we are going to discuss about IP and port numbers. And finally, we are going to summarize the lecture. So these are the four major topics that we are going to discuss in this particular lecture. Now, so what is a socket? A socket is a logical endpoint or we can say it is an interface between an application and a network. So if you need to connect two different applications or in a very simple way, if you want to connect two computers, so you need to create sockets in both the machines. So the applications, whatever the application, okay, for example, application 1, application 2. So application 1 wants to communicate with application 2. So the application is going to create a socket. So in the first machine, a socket will be created. In the second machine also, the socket will be created. Now, so the sockets will be, uh, we can say there are different types of sockets available. Mainly, sockets are of two types. So one is TCP socket and the other one is going to be the UDP socket. So TCP socket is connection oriented, UDP socket is connection less. So TCP is going to be reliable whereas UDP is going to be unreliable. So depending upon the application, if it is a TCP application, it will create a TCP socket. If it is a UDP application, it will create a UDP socket. So depending upon the application, the sockets will be created. Now, we can identify a socket by using two things. So the first one is going to be the IP address. Then the next very important thing is a port number. So IP address, the length of the IP address is 32 bits. Whereas the length of the port number is 16 bits. So for every socket, you are going to have the combination of these two things. That means IP address and port numbers. So this is used to identify the socket. So there are some simple questions available. What is an IP address? An IP address is equal to uniquely identifies a device. Okay, a device or a computer or a host. You can use any word here on your network. So this is going to be IP address. So what is a port number means? Port number is used to identify the services, the different services which are running on your machine. So your port number is equal to uniquely identifies a service running on your server or running on your machine or running on your host. Now adding the above equations, that means we are going to add the IP address and we are going to add the port numbers. So adding these two things, we are going to get or we are going to identify a socket. So by using the IP address and port number, so you can identify, you can uniquely identify a socket on a uh, machine, okay, on a machine or on an, okay, on a server or, or on a client machine, anything. So which is called a socket. So three things here, one is IP address, second one is a port number. So the combination of IP address and port number which is going to be uniquely identify a socket which is running on a machine. Now, if you take socket basics, there are a lot of uh, operations a socket can do. Okay, that means we can say these are all the steps also. So totally there are seven basic operations available for a socket. So first thing, connect to your remote machine. By using a socket, you can connect to your remote machine or you can connect to different machines. Okay, by using a socket, then you can send the data, receiving the data, then binding to your port number. So in the previous slide we discussed. So every socket is going to have an IP address and port number. So this concept is called binding. Okay, so we are going to bind a port number to a particular socket. So you can do binding, then listening for the incoming data. 
So the suffix will be available in the listening state. We are going to discuss about this in the coming slides. So listening for your incoming data, then accepting the connection. Suppose if anybody wants to request, so the other machine that means X and Y, there are two computers available. So X is going to be in the listening state. So Y wants to connect it with X means, okay, the connection request will be accepted. So accept the connections for the remote machines on the uh, bounded ports, whatever the port in which the machine is waiting or listening. And finally, you can close a connection, a socket can be closed. So socket performs seven basic operations. First thing is the connecting, sending the data, receiving the data, binding to a port number, listening for an incoming socket, accepting the connection and finally closing the connection. So these are the basic operations of a socket. Now, so this picture clearly shows there are two machines available. The first machine is a client and second machine is a server machine. So the client machine wants to connect with the server machine and wants to send and receive some data. Now, in the connection, that means in the server machine, the socket is created. You can see this is the green color is the socket we are going to take it. So socket is created. Then the socket will be available in the waiting state. So that means it is going to be a welcoming socket. Or we can say the socket is going to be available in a uh, listening state. Now the client machine wants to connect with the server machine. So the client machine is going to give you a request. Okay, I want to connect it with you or with your application. Now your connection request is coming. So once the connection request comes, so automatically the server machine is going to accept it. So it is accepted. Okay, the connection request is accepted means now a connection is established. Okay, a connection connection is established between the client and the server machine. So using that means the two sockets are now connected. So using that connection, you can send and receive the data. That means the client machine can send some data. The server machine also can send them the data and they are going to do this uh, in a loop. And finally, once the data transmission is over, okay, the socket will be closed. In both the ends, the socket will be closed. So this is how okay, the socket is working. Now, so TCP IP socket programming. So nowadays, if you buy a machine, so automatically the operating system is available in that. In operating system, they installed everything. Okay, but uh, the entire TCP IP showed, it is a, everything is completely installed. So you don't need to create any sockets. But still, there are some programming languages. So using the programming languages, you can create, the users can create, okay, their own sockets, users can create. For example, Java programming. C++ programming, in C++ programming, so in Python, Python also, so many programming language, languages, they support this socket programming concepts. That means a user can create his own socket, the user can okay, uh, connect to the socket, user can bind it, user can send its own data, okay, his own data, receiving data, everything manually you can do. So by using some programming concepts. So that is called the socket program. So if you take Java, in Java there are a lot of packages available okay, for socket programming. So two key classes so which are available in Java programming languages, Java.NET package. So if you go for this Java.NET package, so inside the Java.NET package there are two different classes available. One is the server socket and another one is the socket. So these are the two different uh, classes which are available in java.net package. So server socket means, so using this particular class, you can create, you can create the server socket. So in the previous slide we discussed, so the server socket is going to be available, okay, it is going to be in the waiting state or it is going to be in the listening state, okay, or we can say it is a welcoming socket. So for creating the welcoming sockets, you can use the server socket class. And for creating a ordinary a client socket, so we can use the socket class. Okay, so using these two things, you can connect it, you can send and receive the data. So, what I want to say in this particular slide, 
there are so many programming languages not only in java programming language even using c programming c++ programming okay python programming so using lot of programming languages we can do this tcp socket programming but in our example that means in our slides okay we are talking about the java so java.net that is a package which is available in the java programming language so in that there are two different uh, classes available so one is the server socket class and second one is the socket class now inside every class there will be lot of methods available so we already you already know about it there are lot of methods plenty of methods available so using that particular methods you can create a socket okay you can bind you can connect you can accept you can send the data you can receive the data and finally you can close the socket so you can do anything regarding the socket by using the methods which are available inside the classes now if we take a uh, java socket class okay we are going for the socket class okay we are going to talk about the socket class so this can do uh, seven operations so what are the seven operations we already know okay what are the seven operations the basic operations of a socket we already know so creating the sockets binding the socket connecting or, or accepting sending the data receiving the data and finally closing the connection now out of seven operations socket class is used for both the clients and the servers so it will be used okay there is a class called socket so this class will be used for both the client machine and for the server machine and as the methods that correspond to the first four of these operations so the first four operations means you already know that the first four operation creating okay listening accept okay connect then the last three operation that means sending and receiving the data okay and finally closing the socket these operations are needed only by the servers which wait for the clients to connect to them so all the seven operations we can do okay the seven operation that what we studied in the previous slides we can do by using the circuit class then java programs normally use client sockets in the following fashion okay what is it means so the program creates a new socket with a constructor so you might have studied about the constructor in the programming languages so by using the constructor okay a new socket will be created then the socket attempts to connect to the remote host so by using that you can connect once the socket is created so by using the socket you can connect to your remote host then once the connection is established okay between the two machines between a client machine and a server machine so once the connection is established the local and the remote host get the input and output streams that means it is going to start the data transmission okay so input and output so this connection is going to be full duplex so mostly once if you are connecting two sockets automatically it is going to be full duplex that means you can send and receive the data at the same time that means simultaneously you can send and receive the data when the transmission of data is completed whenever okay the data transmission is over so one or both the sides okay either the client side or the server side or both the sides okay they are going to close the socket so that called socket will be closed so this is the overall summary so how the things are working okay here now so we are going to uh, talk about the java classes okay in depth a socket is simply an endpoint for communication between the machines so we already discussed about this if two machines wants to communicate so automatically we need a socket socket class can be used to create a socket so the socket class this is a class available in java and this is available in java.net package so by using this particular class you can create a socket and you can see the methods so i, I already told about this method there are uh, plenty of methods available inside a class so these are the methods okay so get input stream get output stream and close so these are the major okay there are lot of other methods available so they gave only three here so get input stream get output stream and close so these are the three different methods available so and also we have some more methods okay you can see here accept method so close method so we already by using the name itself it is very clear so get input stream so get input stream means which is going to receive the input get output stream means so that means the output okay data which is going out then closing so closing the socket and you can see here accept the connection okay that means 
if it is a server machine the server machine okay in the server machine the socket is going to be in a listening state so a client machine is going to give the accept okay so once if a client machine is giving the sorry request request so the the server <coughs> excuse me the server machine is going to accept it okay so accepting the connection and also we are having the closing so closing a socket so these are all different methods okay which are available in the uh, socket class inside java.net package now so there are two essential types of socket we already discussed about this one is a tcp socket and second one is a udp socket so these are the two different uh, types of sockets available in lecture number 2 we are going to talk about the tcp socket in lecture number 3 we are going to talk about the udp sockets now so tcp socket we can say otherwise it is called the stream okay you can say as a stream socket it is also known as a stream socket so you know it is a reliable 100% reliable so a reliable delivery will be available so in order guaranteed okay that means the packet will go in a particular order then it is a connection oriented and it is bidirectional so if you are going for a stream socket the stream socket it is 100% reliable okay so that means there will be some acknowledgement concept here and connection established three way handshake okay a three way handshake will be available okay so these are all the of uh, the features of tcp so this features is not going to be available in udp in udp there is no three way handshake there is no acknowledgement concept and it is not going to follow any particular order okay so these are all the drawbacks of udp so now you can see here so this is a server machine okay so the server machine is available in the listening state okay and this is going to be a client machine so the client machine wants to connect so service request so a service request is going on so request is received okay request received so automatically it will be connected okay you can see this is going to be a socket and this is going to be a socket this is the server side and this is going to be the client side so the two sockets will be connected okay so this is how uh, the socket concept is working in our networks now so stream socket it is dedicated it is a dedicated uh, connection a dedicated connection will be available between the client and the server and we can say the stream socket means stream means it is a tcp okay so it is a point to point channel between the server and the client machine so here tcp protocol will be used for data transmission it is 100% reliable so you will be having uh, an acknowledgement okay whatever the data you are sending so you will receive an acknowledgement for that suppose if you are not getting any acknowledgement okay data retransmission will be done so this is going to be a lossless connection data sent or received in the similar order long time for recovering the lost mistaken data suppose if there is any problem available suppose if you miss some data if a packet is missing so in that case so it will take some time but data retransmission will be available so that's why we are going to say it is reliable okay if you see the drawback it is going to be slow okay comparing with udp tcp is going to be slow but tcp is going to be reliable okay so this is the uh, the major difference between the tcp and udp now the next uh, type of socket is datagram socket so previously we discussed about the stream socket so stream socket we can say otherwise it is a tcp so now we are discussing about the datagram socket so datagram socket it is otherwise called udp socket so this is going to be unreliable data can be lost there is no retransmission here and there is no order okay it is not going to follow any order for sending the uh the data the data packets okay it will be seen as it like okay there is it's not going to maintain any particular order so no notion of connection so there is no uh connection will be established okay, no dedicated or logical connection between the client and the server so can send or receive the data you can send or receive the data but here there is no proper guarantee will be given but this will be fast so the udp is going to be fast okay so you can say here so this is going to be a client server machine and this is going to be a client machine 
so you can see here there is no connection request okay uh, no no con connection accept okay simply it is sending okay it is going to send the data so through the intermediate path it is going to reach the destination so again from here okay from the server the data will be sent okay it will be received so here there is no proper guarantee available here there is no retransmission concept available once the data is lost it is lost you cannot recover okay so this is going to be the uh, datagram socket so datagram socket no dedicated and point to point channel between the server and the client machine so it uses udp for data transmission okay udp protocol so in the lecture number 3 again we are going to discuss about this udp concept and not 100% reliable okay so this is a very important point so this method that means the datagram socket is not going to be reliable one and may lose the data so there are plenty of chances available for the data loss data sent or received order might not be the same so in whatever the order you are sending in the same order you will not receive okay the order may change but in the tcp it is not like that whatever the, the order you are sending in the same order you will receive the packet then okay so packet 1 packet 2 packet 3 means you will receive the same order 1 2 3 but here you are sending 1 2 3 packets means maybe you will receive the third packet first maybe you will receive the second packet first so the order is not going to be the same so don't care of the ra rapid recovery lost or mistaken data that means suppose if any packet is lost your udp is not going to worry about it it is not going to do any retransmission here okay so the data is lost means it is lost so this is the difference between the uh, tcp socket and that means the stream socket and datagram socket now so further there are so, some more okay differences we are going to discuss between the tcp and udp so to de design what transport layer protocol that means transport layer protocol tcp and udp are transport layer protocols so these two protocols they are going to work in the transport layer so which type of socket our application should use we need to understand how the tcp and udp differ in terms of so that means depending upon the application so what type of applications you are using so if you are using a tcp application automatically tcp protocol will be selected in the transport layer if you are using an udp application in the application layer so udp protocol will be used here in the transport layer now so the tcp and udp differ in terms of reliability in terms of timing and in terms of overhead okay we are going to discuss the difference between these two so in terms of the reliability so timing and overhead now so i'm going for the reliability okay so you can see the uh, the red color okay whatever the red color given so it is going to be uh, what to say it is going to be a con that means uh, a negative point okay so whatever available in the green is going to be the positive one so pros and cons so green is going to be pros okay and red is going to be cons okay now three things we are taking three important properties one is the reliability timing and overhead so if you take reliability so you know which one is more reliable so automatically tcp is going to be reliable whereas udp is not going to be reliable it is an unreliable one so there is no guarantee that the same datagrams will be received by the receiving socket but here it is not like that it is guaranteed it is 100 percent sure so tcp is going to guarantee that means all the packets sent will be received by the receiver so in terms of reliability tcp is reliable udp is unreliable now going going for the timing so timing in a very simple way if you want to okay if you want me to tell so tcp is going to be a time consuming one okay because directly it is not going to send the data so first it is going to establish a connection then the connection will be okay then it is going to send the data for all the data okay we are going to receive the acknowledgement if the data if the acknowledgement is received not received okay automatically retransmission the data will be sent again so there will be a lot of steps available so time consuming process tcp but whereas the udp is going to be okay it is going to be fast okay it is going to be fast so it is not going to it is not going to take much of time so as far as time is concerned udp is going to be best okay comparing with tc then overhead so overhead means that means other number of steps okay or the packets 
okay that, that means it is called the overhead that means the job or the task it is going to do so almost both are is going to be same but if you take tcp it will be having more overhead okay comparing with udp tcp will have more overhead okay more works to do okay what is that udp every time a datagram is passed into the socket the local and the receiving socket addresses need to be passed along with it so it is going to send the receiving the local and the receiving socket address need to be passed along with that datagram so this is going to be overhead but if you take tcp there will be lot of overhead okay connection establishment acknowledgement okay maintaining the order retransmission everything is going to be overhead okay so tcp is having more overhead comparing with udp okay so these are the three important uh, terms okay that means three important points or we can say it is the three important aspects okay in which we discussed about the, the tcp and udp reliability timing and overhead now so in the java programming language okay we are going to see some code okay some code we are going to discuss so before that so let us discuss about the advantages what are the advantages of creating socket programming using java okay if you ask me comparing with java python is very easy okay actually it is not given in our slides our slides are prepared only based on java programming language but if you compare with java and python python okay writing socket programs in python is going to be very easy okay so you can see the advantages advantages of socket programming in java and disadvantages of socket programming in java okay so what is the disadvantage we can see the disadvantage first java does not expose the full range of socket possibilities to the developers so developers okay they are not able to use the full okay the full range of socket possibilities in java so only the, the basic and intermediate uh, concepts will be implemented but if you see the advantage there are so many advantages available applications are most or more neatly and cleanly written in java than c or c++ actually the number of lines if we take c and c++ the number of lines for writing the uh, socket programming will be more but whereas in java programming we can we can make it very short okay in a very simple way you can write so there are fewer lines of code okay this is the point what i told so a few lines of code and each line can be explained to the novice programmer without much difficulties so here uh, the number of lines is going to be very less that is a very important point okay if you write in c or c++ the number of lines okay in the program is going to be more but whereas in java you can write it around some seven eight lines maximum of 10 lines of program is enough to create a socket and to receive the and to receive and send the data then java keeps off all the transport layer complexity under the cover so you don't need to worry about anything related to the socket layer okay that means the protocols tcp and udp so you don't need to worry about it okay automatically your java programming is going to take care of that so developer can focus on application okay only on the application rather than worrying about how the network and the transport layer operate so we don't need to worry about the transport layer concepts and the network layer concepts as a developer you can concentrate only in the application layer so once if you just okay concentrate only in the application layer it is enough so you don't need to worry about the networking concepts okay and then up transport layer so the java programming language will automatically it will take care of that so java does not rely on the native code that means programmer can communicate over the network in the platform independent fashions so from any platform to any platform using the java programming language so you can communicate from windows to linux okay so linux to solaris so any platform to any platform so if you write it in java automatically you can communicate so these are all the uh, advantages and disadvantages of java socket program now sockets and security so what is this means sockets are the means by which the computers on the network communicate they open your computer to attack so once if you create a socket so automatically your machine is going to be vulnerable okay it is going to be vulnerable so somebody is the attacker knows that a socket is available in your machine and the socket is available in the listening state means the attacker can try or attacker can exploit that particular uh, socket to launch the attack so very popular attack is the denial of service attack okay so the simplest possible attack is a denial of service attack just like a 
telemarketer that calls you at your home uh, like so a socket is in the listening state okay in your machine just imagine a socket is available in the listening state so i am an attacker so what i can do means i can give you accept okay that means i can give you a connection request okay i am giving you a connection request and you are going to accept it then immediately i am going to close the connection the same thing i am going to repeat so i am giving you a connection request the request is coming to you you are accepting the connection okay now i am going to close the connection so if i do this repeatedly several times if i repeat this that is going to be the denial of service attack and another thing very important thing is every socket is having a port number so if a socket is listening means automatically the port number is open so if a port number is open the attacker can enter into that okay the attacker can enter into your machine by using that particular port number so once the socket is created automatically you need more security okay that means you are becoming vulnerable and you have to maintain okay or you have to implement security for that okay so we can see the points now so the simplest possible attack is a denial of service attack just like a telemarketer that calls you at home incessantly that means regularly okay is going to call another common attack is to exploit the vulnerability in a particular programming listening port okay this is the point i, uh, I already told so in the listening port so you, you are going to bind a port number for your socket so if that particular port number is a vulnerable port number automatically you will become vulnerable then it is possible to trick a listening ser server program that end allowing un okay unauthorized access to that program or even the whole computer so if your socket is in the listening automatically the attackers can cheat it okay and unauthorized uh, unauthorized users can enter into your machine by using the socket which is open then the attacker either wants data on the server or wants to use the machine as a node okay that means your machine can be attacked or that your machine can be used to launch the attack okay that is called the uh, botnet so your machines can be directly attacked or your machine can be used to attack someone okay so this is going to be the security issues available so whenever you create a socket you have to be very careful then identifying a process on your host so what is this means so we are now going to talk about the port numbers so in the slide number 1 we discussed for a socket you need two things one is ip address and second one is a port number so the length of the ip address is 32 bits ipv4 the length of a port number is 16 bits so if you take port numbers there are 65535 port numbers available okay starting from port number 1 1 2 65535 65, port numbers available so this port numbers we are dividing into some categories okay some groups okay so starting from 0 to okay so they start from 0 no issues so 0 to 65535 port numbers are available now we are dividing this into two or three categories okay we are dividing into three groups or three different categories we are dividing so the first category is called well known port numbers the second category is called the registered port numbers then the third one is a dynamic or private port number okay i repeat so port numbers are used to identify the service which are running on a machine the length of the port number is 16 bits okay 16 bits so port numbers ranges from 0 to 65535 so this 0 to 65535 we are dividing into three okay we are dividing into three groups so the first group is called the well known port numbers second group is called the registered port numbers third group is called the dynamic or private port numbers so this is a very important multiple choice question okay well known port numbers what is the range means from 0 to 1023 okay it is not 1024 it is 1023 then 1024 to 49151 so this is going to be registered port numbers then 49152 Six five five three five sixty five thousand five hundred and thirty five. Up to this, it is called the dynamic or private port numbers. Now, so what is this zero to twenty four thousand twenty four means? This is registered. Okay, we are going to see the example. It is already registered for a particular service. For example, port number eighty. 
So port number 80 means it is going to be uh, wave, that means HTTP. So it is not going to be changed. So like that 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So up to 1024, it is registered for a particular purpose. So who is controlling this? Okay, who is the organization, the name of the organization which is controlling this? Who is this means IANA? So IANA means Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They are controlling this. Okay, they are controlling and this cannot be changed. Then the second group is called the registered port numbers. And this registered port numbers, it is 1024 to uh, 49151. This is not controlled by the IANA, but this is controlled by IANA. But here, IANA registers and lists, okay, that means people can register, okay. For example, I'm having an organization, I'm running a software company. I need a port number for my application. <coughs> Excuse me. So in that case, I can register a port number with IANA. If you see uh, like Microsoft, HP, Dell, so they have registered some port numbers okay, in this group. Then the last group of port number is called the dynamic port numbers, private port number. This is very commonly used okay, by your machine and by my, my machine, okay, if a client machine. So I am a client machine means for a client machine automatically any port number within this range will be selected. So this is called a uh, private port number or we can say as a dynamic port Okay, these are the three different groups of port numbers available. Okay, now you can see here port numbers. So 0, 1 up to 65,535 port numbers available. So there are three different groups available. We already discussed about these three groups. Now you can see these are some examples for well-known port numbers. So port number 80. Okay, this is the first group. Okay, it is HTTP or we can say it is web. Port number 23, it is used for telnet. Port number 2021, it is used for the FTP, okay, file transfer protocol. So like this, a very big list is available. You can search it in the internet, okay, list of well-known port numbers. If you put the list, okay, you will get a very big list of port numbers starting from 0 to 2024 plus you can see the registered also, okay, registered port numbers also you can see it in the internet. Now, the next one is limitations. So limitations means, okay, the drawbacks. What are the uh, drawbacks of uh, IP, Internet Protocol? So there are three things we are going to discuss here. So one is going to be the size. So what is the maximum size of your IP datagram? So this is first limitation. Then the second limitation is going to be the MTU, okay, maximum transmission unit. Then the next one is going to be the uh, path MTU. So these are the three uh, important uh, limitations available for an IP address, for an, uh, for an IP Internet Protocol. Okay, so what is the first limitation means? It is related to the size. What will be the size of a datagram, a IP datagram? So what will be the maximum size? So in case of IPv4, what is the maximum size? And in case of IPv6, what will be the maximum size of a IPv uh, datagram? If you see in IPv4, so the maximum size of a datagram will be 65,535, which is including the header. Okay, there will be two ports available. One is the header port and second one is a payload port. So including the header and payload, so the maximum size of a single IP datagram is 65,535 bytes, okay, in the case of IPv4. So in case of IPv6, the size of a single, okay, that means the size of a, uh, a single datagram is going to be 65,575, okay, 575. So, which is including 40 byte of IPv6 header, including header. So, why is 40 byte is increased means because the length of the IP address. So, the length of the IPv4 is 32 bits, but the length of the IPv6 is 128 bits. So, this is going to be the first limitation. Then, the second limitation is many networks have a MTU. Okay, we are using okay the Ethernet. So, Ethernet is a very popular technology we are using. So whatever the MTU supports by IP, it doesn't matter. But if you take, okay, the Ethernet, the Ethernet or cable, you can say Ethernet cable. So what is the maximum transmission unit of a M, okay, of a Ethernet cable is thousand five hundred bytes. Okay, thousand five hundred bytes. What is this teacher? You can understand in the next point. So what is this means? So you can see the path MTU. About path MTU in the next slide, we are going to discuss about the path MTU in detail. 
Now, so how to select the path MTU? Okay, my MTU is okay higher. In my network, I have okay MTU which is very large. But if you see the path from one machine to another machine, so the path is available. In between the path, there will be so many routers available. So whatever the minimum MTU only, you can use it. Okay, I will explain this in the next slide. You can understand it better. So the smallest MTU in the path between the two hosts. So this is going to be your path MTU. So suppose if the size of your packet is more than this MTU means you have to do fragmentation. If the size of the IP, okay, nothing, 65,535 bytes, you can have a single, okay, a single IP datagram. But the path MTU, generally the, the MTU of a Ethernet cable is going to be 1500 means you cannot send this. Okay, you cannot send. So what you have to do, you have to divide a single datagram into four pieces or five pieces we have to divide. Okay, so this is. So even though IP is supporting, internet protocol is supporting up to 65,535 bytes, a single IP datagram, but your path MTU is not going to support. So in that case, what you have to do means you have to do the fragmentation. So fragmentation means you have to cut your packets into small, small pieces. Okay, you can understand this in the coming slide. You can see here. Now, this is your host and this is the another host. Okay, the two hosts are connected by using so many routers. Okay, so these two machines are connected by using so many routers. Now, if you see the local MTU, Okay, of this network, the local MTU is, is going to be 400 bytes. Okay, that means you can send more data at the same, at the same time. Here, if you see the local MTU of this network, it is 1500. Now, in between we have a network, router to router, we have a network which is going to be, okay, 2000 bytes. Now, in this case, in this case, if I want to send the data from host 1 to the host, Okay, two. If I want to send, what will be the maximum size of your, of my packet? Means the maximum size is going to be okay. I have to choose the least one here. So the least one is going to be thousand five hundred. So thousand five hundred only I can okay create a packet. So the size of the datagram is going to be only thousand five hundred. Okay. So even my machine. Okay, the thing I have a car. I can okay. The maximum speed of my car is two hundred to twenty, even two forty. But I cannot drive, I cannot drive to wonder. So what I can do means, I have to see what is the speed of the road, the speed limit. So if it is 80 km speed, okay, the limit is 80 km, I have to go only in 80 km. Okay, if it is 50 km speed, I have, to, I have to obey it, I have to follow that, the same concept. So your car is very fast, it can go even 200 km per hour, but what is the speed limit of the road? So here, my network MTU is 4000. So here in between 2000 and here 1500 means for this particular path. Okay, for this particular path, what is the path MTU means? The least one. The least one is 1500. 1500 is the least one. So the path MTU is 1500. So I am going to do the fragmentation here. All the packets will be cut into 1500, 1500, 1500 bytes. Okay, so this is the concept and this is going to be a limitation. Okay, so this is going to be a uh, limitation of uh, IP. Okay, so internet protocol, it is also a limitation. Now, so the next one, IP fragmentation attack. So we discussed about uh, fragmentation in the previous slide, what is fragmentation? Suppose if the size of a datagram is greater than the size of the MTU or the path MTU, so automatically you are going to fragment the package. The packet will be fragmented. So that means the packet will be cut into pieces. Okay. So that means the size of the packet should be less than the size of the path MTU. Okay. That is a concept. Now, so this fragmentation concept will be used by the attackers to attack a machine. Okay. So this is, this is the concept we are going to discuss here. Now, an IP fragmentation attack. Okay, generally we are going to say it is a fragmentation attack. So the fragmentation attack uses the concept of fragmentation to disturb the services. Okay, it is going to disturb the services or even it is going to disable the devices. Even a, a machine can be disabled. Okay, a server can shut down. 
okay a client mission okay can be disturbed so using the fragmentation concepts so even you can uh, disturb your particular service or yet you can disturb a particular machine itself okay you can disturb okay so this is fragmentation attack now so they generally involves sending the datagrams that will be impossible to reassemble upon the delivery so that means tiny fragmentation we can see in the next slide so the fragmentation will be very small okay it will be very very small so that you cannot merge okay you cannot reassemble the packets so this is this is the general uh, the scenario or the general technique which will be used by the attackers okay forwarding a tiny fragmented okay datagrams so that the destination cannot be okay reassemble upon the delivery upon the receiving their uh, datagram so they cannot okay they cannot assemble it then what is the goal what is the aim of this okay concept means so the goal is to abuse the server's resources okay this is a type of denial of service attack only so it is going to abuse it is going to misuse the server's uh, resources and prevent them from performing the operations they are supposed to do okay this is going to be the denial of service attack so not allowing a server to do its job okay so we are going to give a lot of tiny packets so automatically the server will busy in that in reassembling that so the server time will be wasted so this is uh, ip fragmentation attack so you can see some examples here so the first one is a tiny fragment attack then the second one is the udp and icp uh, sorry icmp fragmentation and last one tcp or tier drop attack so three different attacks we are going to discuss now okay so let us discuss about the first one which is the tiny fragment attack so the word itself it is very clear tiny so tiny means small so a tiny fragment attack occurs when a tiny packet fragment gets into the server so when a small small pieces of packets okay the attacker is going to create that so when a tiny fragmented packets are received by a server okay so what is happening what happens suppose if a server is receiving okay tiny packets or tiny or fragmented packets if a, if a server is receiving what is going to happen means so when one of the fragments are so small that it cannot even fit its own header okay so that means the size of the packet will be very very small so that it cannot fit into the header its own header so this types of packets so part of this packet header is sent as a new fragment so this is going to be uh, it's going to happen okay that means the server machine cannot reassemble the things and finally what is the cost means reassembly problem and shutdown a server sometimes the server may get restart so the server may shutdown also the server resources will become uh, busy okay so this denial of service attacks will be created here then the next type of attack is udp and icmp so icmp means so particularly the ping packets internet control message protocol so icmp fragmentation attack so what is it means the servers are flooded with oversized or otherwise okay corrupt packets that must be rejected so the servers are flooded okay that means the server that means the attacker is going to flood the attacker is going to send okay too many packets which is oversized that means the size will be more than the normal or otherwise corrupt packets okay the packet which are corrupted that must be rejected so this is uh, a attacker flooding okay flooding with udp and icmp fragment Uh, or icmp packets which are oversized then so quickly overload a server's resource the server will become overloaded and prevent it from performing its intended operation so the server is going to be uh, there is a concept called ping of death okay it is not covered here so ping of death what does that means you can send a ping packet okay with a oversized packet so uh, what will be the consequences means sometimes the server may uh, get restart also that means this will get will become shut down also okay so these are all uh, different possibilities available and the third type of attack is tcp or tear drop attack so what is a tear drop attack means it uses the packets designed to be impossible to reassemble so you cannot reassemble the packet upon the delivery you are receiving the uh, fragments but it will be difficult to reassemble it 
okay in, in any order you need some you, you need to follow some order but what will be available in the packet means whatever the information available in the packet so it is not enough to reassemble it so the packets can be incomplete you can see here or the packets can be overlapping okay it's duplicate packets then it is usually directed towards the defragmentation or security systems so these are all uh, different techniques used by the attackers only in the fragmentation okay by using the fragmentation concepts so the attackers can play with the server like this okay by using the different concepts so if it is not protected appropriately the packets can cause an operating system to freeze or to crash even your operating system will be crashed or it is unable to process them okay so there are three uh, different concepts okay tiny fragment attack udp and icmp fragmentation attack tcp or the tear drop attack but all the three attacks okay the what will be the concept means uh, the attackers is going to use the fragmentation concept and the attackers are going to create denial of service attack okay denial of service attack uh, denial of service attack to the servers okay so this is the uh, concept so with this we are completing lecture number 1 okay you can see lecture number 2 okay in a separate video keep watching thank you